I am a soothsayer. We're just like underground. Exactly. Slightly better paid. That's the difference. Hey, we'll solve all these problems. That'll be great. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome back. So we've got some good GLM things to do today. So I'd like to get right into it. Uh, when I left you before, we had fit our first binomial models um, with actual predictor variables in them. And here are the three models we're going to compare. The top model is just the intercept-only model for the chimpanzee prosociality data. Remember, the outcome variable is pulling the left lever on this weird table. And then two other models, 10.2 uh, just has the uh, whether the left lever was attached to two pieces of food or one. That's what prosocial left means. And then the model that inspires the design of the experiment, 10.3, has an interaction with condition, which means whether or not there's another animal present at the other end of the table to receive the extra piece of food that is teleported towards that end of the table when you pull that lever. Um, so let's do the model comparison. And uh, what I want you to see here, I think it's fairly obvious from the weights, is that 10.2 does um, uh, substantially better than 10.3, although it's not, you know, it's not impossible that uh, the interaction matters, but um, three quarters of the weight is getting assigned to 10.2. Um, and you can see that the standard error is actually pretty small. So uh, uh, if you double the standard error there, it still barely overlaps the other one. So it uh, looks like 10.2 is pretty much better, and the interaction doesn't really help prediction here, given these data and these models. Um, so it's, of course, easier. Let's look at the coefficients on 10.32 to check and make sure uh, we know what's going on. Um, remember, the hypothesis is that when the, um, uh, when the other individual is present, um, they will uh, pull the prosocial uh, lever more. And, and as you can see, the marginal posterior distribution for the interaction effect is uh, all over the place and it's slightly negative. There's not much signal. And uh, I leave it as an exercise to the student, although we're going to plot the posterior predictions later to verify that when you push all these things out and deal, therefore, with the covariances among these parameters, that it doesn't change that story. Um, the jokes basically don't care uh, if there's another animal present, but they do care about which side of the table has more food. And you can see that in the coefficient for uh, BP there is where the prosocial option is. And yes, they do pull the left lever when it's attached to more pieces of food that they're not getting. Uh, and then, uh, just so no one thinks that I'm trying to say chimps are stupid, chimps are really clever. Uh, but it's very easy in cross-species psychology to make another species look dumb, right? Because you design an experiment in which you would be smart enough to figure it out. <laughs> the fact that they're not is not evidence they're stupid, right? I'm sure if I put you guys in in uh, uh, the forest with a group of chimpanzees, you'd be the dumbest chimpanzee that ever lived. <laughs> and, uh, you'd be terrible at finding fruit. You wouldn't know how to make a nest out of branches. It would be a total mess. So don't, I'm not trying to be a cross-species chauvinist here. It's just, this is what happens when you design experiments that human children are good at, other apes are bad at them. That doesn't mean they're bad animals, right? That's just how it goes. Um, okay, so... Uh, now let's talk about interpreting uh, effects in, in binomial models, logistic regressions. And there are lots of conventional ways of reading these coefficients. And you folks know my mantra by now. I think, I think interpreting coefficients is always really hazardous. It's, you can get good at a particular set of models and particular kinds of data, and you can do it. Uh, but you've got to be careful not to get cocky, because you can't trick yourself. And I'm going to keep showing you examples of places where you can trick yourself. Remember, just with ordinary linear models and interactions, it's already hard because the effect of changing um, a, param uh, a predictor variable depends upon more than one parameter in any model with interactions. Uh, and you can have strong correlations among parameters that you can't see in a table of coefficients because tables of coefficients only show marginal posterior distributions. So you miss the covariances among them. Um, with generalized linear models, it gets even worse because uh, now everything is potentially interactive. And in particular, there's this base rate effect. Um, and I want to spend a little bit of time warning you about that now. So one way to think about that is in these kinds of models, the parameters are on a relative effect scale because the, they're in the linear model space, at least, independent of the other terms in it, right? Those little beta coefficients are. They're relative effects that ignore things like the intercept and where it's located. And because of ceiling and floor effects, 
the absolute effect on the prediction scale of a change in a, in a predictor depends upon the intercept and the coefficient of the slope uh, on that term. And so uh, there's this distinction I want to push on you guys uh, between relative shark and absolute penguin, and the penguin's better. <laughs> right? So it's just, I was just trying to come up with a metaphor here. I never really finished developing it. But. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Sharks and penguins. Okay, you'll remember it, right? That's all that matters. So uh, parameters on the relative effect scale, they ignore base rate. So that's like a shark. I don't know. And again, I didn't quite finish it. Uh, predictions are the absolute effect scale. Uh, they account for base rate like the penguin. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so, again, all that matters is you remember absolute penguin. <laughs> and, uh, okay, so we want, uh, now both of these, both the relative scale and the absolute scale are value and interpretation, but you just, you shouldn't mix them up. So I want to, I want to give you a couple examples of problems here. Um, it's quite common, though, for people to quote relative effects, because you can just take single coefficients in a logistic regression. And if you exponentiate them, you get something called the log odds, the, the change, the proportional change in log odds, and or proportional <coughs> change in odds. And those are often things reported as odds ratios. Now, if they're greater than one, that means uh, changing, increasing the predictor increases the response, and uh, decreasing the predictor decreases the response. But that ignores base rate. It ignores the ceiling and floor effect. So you don't actually get a sense on an absolute scale of how important it is to know that predictor in a natural system. So I'm going to give you a, an example on the next slide, but to, to set it up for you, set up the punchline, uh, I think there's a preference, especially in the medical literature, for relative effects, for relative shark, uh, because it makes things seem important. It makes things seem way more important that neglect of base rate can make things really, really important. So that's good for scaring people, and it's good for getting published. Right? You can have an odds ratio of two, there's a 100% increase, but it could still have almost no practical effect on anybody. Uh, and I'll give you an example of that on the next slide. Um, and uh, so you have to be careful about these things. Uh, so here's, here's a real-world example that I'm sure some of you have heard of, and it keeps coming up uh, frequently, in the UK at least. So it is a medical fact that um, being on birth control pills incre increases the probability of lots of bad things. Uh, this is not news to anybody in the audience, at least who's being held. Right. And uh, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, I'll jump to the end. Pregnancy is way worse for you than all of those things. <laughs> right. I don't mean that as like an antenatal <laughs> issue, but like pregnancy is the most dangerous thing a female ape will ever do, <laughs> right? Uh, in terms of endogenous mortality risk. Uh, so these other, the side effects of birth control pills are minor compared to the thing that they're preventing. Uh, and you can forget that, uh, but anyway, that's not the punchline I'm actually getting to, but um, <laughs> It's worth keeping in mind as I set it up. So the, the actual numbers run something like this. Uh, one in a thousand women in the UK uh, will develop uh, potentially lethal, quite seriously complicating blood clots. These are typically in the legs um, uh, in their lifetime. Uh, three in a thousand women on birth control will develop these blood clots. Uh, this is a 200% increase in risk, right? Because an additional two women per thousand are going to get these horrible blood clots, which are, they're bad things. Um, as a consequence of this fact, uh, British physicians were required by law to start telling women that birth control could kill them, and a lot of them went off birth control. And as a consequence, many more of them died from complications during pregnancy. Uh, this is the thing that arises from base rate neglect, from focusing on relative risk rather than absolute risk. Take it all into account to give good medical advice. This is a famous example now in, in evidence-based medicine, which is my favorite phrase, right? <laughs> it implies that there's another kind of medicine <laughs> that is not based on evidence. And yes, that's the kind that we get. <laughs> and, uh, so anyway, the actual absolute change in probability is only 0 0.002. It's a minuscule thing. There, there, you should be worried more about traffic uh, than this particular risk, uh, even if you don't balance it against that pregnancy is much more dangerous. Um, uh, than the blood clots you get from this. Does this help clarify the distinction between relative shark and absolute penguin? Yeah. Uh, again, I have to finish developing that analogy. I just, I just liked it, and I wanted to try to develop it. So if you're giving that example and you're talking about it, um, what do you present them? Like, do you say, oh, there's a 200% increase, but... Present so both. I, yeah, I would present both. Um, but absolutely, once you, once you learn this absolute effect that... Uh, a woman switching from uh, going off birth control to prevent blood clots, she's only reduced her probability by 0 0.002. It suddenly seems a lot less serious, right? Uh, and also, you probably also want to report in this that 
And by the way, pregnancy itself, if you happen to be going off birth control dramatically increases, to say the least, uh, the probability you'll get pregnant. And um, uh, that pregnancy is way more dangerous on average than, uh, than uh, being on the pill. Yeah, so both things matter. But this gets, again, we're back at my horoscopic problem, right? In, the, in this particular data case, I think you can get very practical advice about exactly what to say, because um, we know a lot of the context. In other cases, it'll be different. Um, and that was what my next slide is, is kind of about, is that both matter. So here's, here's one of the things that uh, my pet peeves is, you'll often hear this quote, and, and um, it's in one of my son's uh, books that I read to him at bedtime, actually, that more people, it's a, it's a, it's a cool book about sharks, uh, and there's this one page that drives me crazy because it says, more people die from bee stings than shark bites. And this page always leads me off into a statistical rant that my son just endures. <laughs> right? But uh, it's like, okay, I, I believe that. Yeah, yeah, deer care more people per year than sharks. I, I believe that. I don't know if this hippo number seems crazy, but, <laughs> but uh, it's possible. I, I have actually almost been killed by a hippo. I used to do field work in Africa, and I'll tell you, they're the real deal. Uh, they are the gangsters uh, of that ecology. Uh, but, um, but here's the thing. This ignores... This is weird because, of course, it, the background to this number is it ignores exposure, right? Uh, so when you're in the water, you're much more likely to die from a shark bite than a bee sting. <laughs> most of the time, you're not in the water. Uh, this is the rant my son is just like nodding to. It's like, so many times. He's like, okay, I know the bees. Yes, the <laughs> but uh, 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 nevertheless, so the, the, the relative risk here of the shark, though, is much higher. And this is focusing on the absolute scale, and it doesn't tell you the information you want. So I put this up here as a counterexample to the previous slide to say it depends upon the context. Because you want to know the information you'd like to deliver to people is when you're in the water, say near San Diego, sharks are dangerous. Yes, they are. And they don't kill that many people, but they do kill people. So learn to watch out for them and understand a little bit of shark body language and you know, think about relative sharks. Uh, sharks are relatively dangerous in the water. Out of the water, they're not very dangerous, <laughs> unless you're on stage at the Super Bowl halftime show, perhaps. <laughs> there is some risk of being killed by a shark. <laughs> but uh, anyway, does this make sense? What I'm trying to say here? Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was the that, that was the only part of the Super Bowl I watched this year. Actually, it was satisfying. Uh, the sharks made it for me. Okay, so. Um, let's get back to, to regression. So here's the model we've been working with. Um, let's try to push some uh, predictions out of this thing. The, the basic strategy is the same in previous models. You just have to attend to the new bits of machinery. Uh, but the steps are the same. There's just some new bits in here. So now, in, in particular, we've got this link function. So there's an intermediate step uh, between uh, the linear model. You calculate the value of the linear model, uh, but then you have to transform it with a function before you can plug it into the likelihood. Uh, and that function is the inverse link. It's the inverse of the link function itself. And so in the case of a logit link, the inverse is the logistic function. So you compute the value of the linear model. I'll show this on the next slide. And then you plug it into the logistic function. Then you get a predicted probability uh, that you could put into a binomial simulation or just make inferences from itself. This is one of the, the frustrating and satisfying things about... Um, uh, logistic regression or binomial models in general is that we want our determinative inference is a probability, but the data are not probabilities, right? So we want to know things about proportions of outcomes on a probability scale, uh, but the data are counts. And this is typical of generalized linear models. And I said this before, and I want to emphasize it again, is that the data are measured on a different scale than the things we're going to make inferences about. Right? We're making inferences about log odds and probabilities, but we, what we observe are never those things. They're not observable. And proportions aren't observed ever, right? You calculate them from data, uh, but you don't see them or measure them directly. And that's a, that's a, it's, again, it's satisfying because it meets nature where it's at. Uh, it does it the right way. It's frustrating because it's cognitively hard uh, for everyone. And you get good at it, though, trust me. You do this a few times, and it's not so bad. But I just want to warn you about that. So that's what this inverse link is accomplishing, is getting us back out to the outcome scale. Well, it gets us to the parameter scale, the probability scale, and then we can go to outcomes from there. So what's this look like? Um, remember, you, you've got uh, parameter values. Let's just think about map estimates for the moment. If you plug those map values into this uh, line of our kind of pseudocode here, uh, no, I just want to show you the symmetry between this line of our code, two-thirds down the slide, and the linear model definition in the mathematical version of the model. 
as always, are the same thing. Uh, but now what this implies, logit of P equal to the linear model, implies that P is the logistic of the linear model. So when you do any code, you're going to do it that way. Does this make some sense? Yeah? When you actually do it, uh, you'll see what happens. You get probabilities out of it. The logistic of the linear model is, is always constrained to a zero one interval. That's why we use it. Yeah, in fact, it's the only reason <laughs> uh, pretty much we use it. Well, it's a little better than that. In this case, it turns out the logit link is maximum entropy link uh, uh, in this case. Um, it's the, uh, the logistic regression called the, the maximum entropy classifier. Um, so that's what I want you to learn heuristically from this. Is if your model has a logit link, so that you define the logit of the probability of a success as equal to a linear model. What this implies is the probability when you want to compute predictions later is equal to the logistic of the linear model. It just undoes the conversion. All right, so what do predictions look like? The code to produce this plot is in the book. Uh, it's got no surprises. It's the same kind of stuff you've been doing before, but I do encourage you to carry through with the exercise and make sure uh, that you understand the only tricky part now is this logistic thing. However, link, sim, and ensemble work for these DLM models just as easily as they do the others. You may not even notice there's a difference. But it's important to me, at least, to know that you guys know that deep inside the machine, there's this inverse link thing going on now. Technically, those Gaussian models had a link function, too. Uh, it's called the identity link. <laughs> it just says that the function of mu is equal to the linear model is mu. Right? There, that's what identity link means. So that's what it's called in the literature. Um, so link and sim and ensemble handle all these uh, link functions because technically they think there's always a link there. Um, so what you're looking at on this graph are the, uh, this is uh, the posterior predictions um, superimposed on the raw data. Each blue trend is an individual chimpanzee in the data. Uh, they're averages. So each of the four combinations of the two treatment variables, whether pro which side of the table pro the prosocial option is on, left or right, um, and the condition, whether there was a partner at the other end of the table or not, uh, that gives us four kinds of uh, treatment settings. Uh, each chimpanzee experienced 18 trials uh, in each of those four. That's what, how the data are structured. Uh, so in these blue plots show for individual chimpanzees, um, their averages, their average proportion of pulled wealth across them. Now, first thing you notice, of course, there's this zigzagging, uh, but, but the first thing you actually probably notice is the predictions are terrible. Right? Uh, there's a tremendous amount of heterogeneity among individuals. Um, the, the black line is the posterior uh, mean proportion pooled, and then the 95% interval of that probability. Um, it picks up the zigzag that you're seeing. And where does that come from? Uh, when the prosocial is on, uh, uh, yeah, what is it? When prosocial is on the left, they pull left more. That's what it is, right? So it goes up when the prosocial goes on the left. It goes back down when the prosocial is on the right because they're pulling right more, right? The bottom of the graph is pulling right. The top of the graph is pulling left. Um, that's where the zigzagging comes from. It comes from the fact that they're attracted to food. Even if they're not getting it, they're attracted to it. But there's almost no effect at all. Uh, if there is any effect, it's slightly negative of the other individual being present. And then the major story uh, that you get, what you get from looking at these posterior prediction checks that you don't get from tables of coefficients ever is you notice that the real story here is heterogeneity among individuals. Uh, individuals are, have strong handedness preferences, uh, as apes do. <laughs> and in fact, chimpanzees like humans are majority right-handed, uh, but there are left-handed individuals. Uh, in fact, there is one individual you may notice at the top of this graph who only pulled the left lever ever. <laughs> it's constitutionally incapable of pulling anything else. <laughs> and. Uh, this, this is actor number two, and actor number two is special. So we're going to turn to actor number two in a moment and talk about how to deal with situations like this because it reveals, it's one of the things I like about this data set for teaching. It reveals something interesting about GLMs. We're about to get there. Um, questions about this? Make sense? Ready to keep going? All right. Uh, one thing you might wonder, we, we fit these models with map, um, but uh, I told you that in general uh, GLMs can have um, non-quadratic, that is, uh, posterior, non-quadratic posterior distributions, meaning the posterior distributions may not be, may not resemble multivariate normal. This is a case where they do. Uh, for these models, the quadratic approximation is excellent, actually, uh, for the models we've fit so far. And I'm just showing you that um, this code here is enough. Uh, you can actually just pass in a map fit into map to stand, and it just sucks the data and formula out, right? Because that's all it's doing, and then runs the Markov chain. And uh, then I'm showing you this table of coefficients is the same. And then if you look at the pairs plot, uh, each of the marginal posteriors is, is close to Gaussian, and they're bivariate Gaussian as well. This is a nice uh, 
Central limit theorem saves us. It works really well in these cases. Um, that said, we're going to move toward next into a case where uh, it, it isn't Gaussian. I'll show you what happens. Uh, and to do this, we're going to crawl forward and add handedness. There's a lot of heterogeneity um, among the individual tendencies due to handedness preferences. It'd be nice to control for that variation so that maybe we can see the treatment effects better. This is a, a thing we're going to come to later today as well for a different data set. And uh, so how are we going to do this? I want to take this opportunity to introduce you to a notational convention for doing dummy variables, uh, multiple inter categorical intercepts, um, that we're going to use with multi-level models as well. And it's, it's, I think I mentioned this way back in, what was it, Chapter 5 when we introduced dummy variables. But this is the way I prefer to do it. Instead of having um, some category that gets assigned the intercept, and then uh, all the remaining categories get dummy variables made for them, we're going to just have a vector of intercepts, and each category gets its own in the data. And the way we can note this, one convention for doing that is to put this little bracket uh, on the parameter, the bracket i. This means uh, alpha uh, for the actor value for case i. Um, and this corresponds that there's a, there's a column in your data set called actor, and it has integers in it. And those integers are the indices of a vector of parameters. Uh, that, I know you're staring at me like, huh? Well, we'll, we'll I'll show you what's going on here. Um, so, uh, this is what I'm talking about. The first part, we, we define a unique intercept for each actor. That is, there's, a, there's an alpha 1, an alpha 2, an alpha 3, an alpha 4, an alpha 5, an alpha 6, and, a, and an alpha 7 in this data set because there are seven chimpanzees that participate in the experiment. Um, so alpha sub actor i means take the ith value of the actor column and put that value in as an index. And give me that parameter out of that vector of alphas. Yeah. And... Uh, what that looks like in the data is if you just type D dollar sign, uh, remember dollar sign means extract in our lingo, extract the actor column out of, out of the frame D. Um, this is what it is. Uh, for every row in the data, there's an actor ID, and this is the chimpanzee that did the pulling uh, on that particular trial. So you notice for a bunch of them, so this starts at uh, these numbers in brackets on the left are like the I values. They tell you the case you're at. So the first case and you'd get alpha sub 1 if you got the ith, that is the first value of actor out of it. And then so on for a while, you'd be making predictions with the first uh, uh, intercept parameter, and then you switch it to 2, and then it's the second one. So you're going to estimate all these. This is identical to what we did before. Uh, it's just I prefer to do it this way because it's cognitively easier, and you don't have to remember which category you aliased out or any of that stuff. Um, uh, there's a symmetry among it now. And this is how we're going to do multi-level models, too, because it's the conventional way to do multi-level models. Does this make some sense? It'll only really make sense once you do it, right, like everything else in this class. Uh, and then, even then, maybe not, but that's okay. Got years of science ahead of you to actually understand what's going on. So um, we assign prior still, and this notation, alpha sub actor, that means the whole vector. The whole vector, every element of it, uh, is assigned the same normal prior. So every one of those intercepts uh, gets the same weakly regularizing prior. Okay. All right. Um, oh, and I should say, too, on log odd scale, remember, zero means a coin flip. So if we have a normal prior on an alpha intercept for a log odds model, that's saying that the prior is centered on equal chance of either op outcome. Uh, and 10 is really wide, so it covers, it's, it's nearly flat over the whole range of, of log odds out to 5 and minus 5, which, remember, 5 means always, minus 5 means never uh, in log odds. Uh, so this is a very weakly, uh, very weakly regularizing. I, I actually prefer zero one uh, very often when I do modeling uh, in these contexts. Um, okay, uh, how do you fit this in Map to Stan? Uh, you can insert. I'll highlight them in red. Uh, you just put brackets by the uh, parameter symbol, and it, what it interprets from this is, oh, you want a vector of alphas. How long? Well, let me count up how many unique values of actor there are. And that's what it does. Uh, and it makes a vector now of uh, intercepts for you. You can do this in map, too. Um, uh, it'll work the same way. Yeah? So do you have to make sure that R knows ahead of time that it's a factor, that factor is a factor and not an integer, or we'll just figure that out? Actor is not a factor. Okay. Actor is an integer. Okay. So it, fig so it figures out that you need these separate categories. It, this is actor. Right. It's not a factor. 
<laughs> I'm going to start having fun with this if I get to say it again. <laughs> if you had actor as a factor, <laughs> <laughs> you have to say actor as a factor. Or like, could it if, if actor was a factor with a factor in it. <laughs> Um, now, now I'm trying to think something wrong. Um, I'm reading Dr. Seuss with my son, too, so I'm really primed to rhyme. And at least three of you have been sending me two change videos lately so, uh, because of last week's lectures. But anyway, um, what was the question? <laughs> if actor is a factor, so if it weren't a bunch of integers. It, would, it wouldn't run. It wouldn't run because it's text. Uh, uh, so, and in fact, the factor data type in R is is a pox. It's it's really dangerous. It's, I don't know what your opinion of it is. They are integers, actually. Underneath, right? There's this latent level where they're actually integers, and they're mapped onto a list of labels. And it's so easy to get confused. It's tragic when it happens. And so, um, I prefer never having factor data types in your data frame because it's. I mean, if you're really careful, you can handle it, but you just, it, it trips people up a lot. So, um, yeah, if actor is a factor, convert it to an integer. And a little bit later today, I'm going to show you, uh, there's a function in... Um, Richard, just really fast to clarify yeah. that. So you don't have to tell R that that's not a continuous variable. No, it just, it, just it finds all the unique integer values. It's your job to make sure it's well-groomed. Okay. Uh, what I was going to say is... Uh, in the ne next example later today, um, there's a convenience function in the rethinking package called coerce index, which you can give it a factor, and it makes it into a list of unique integers starting at one. Because uh, this is a thing that I do all the time, right? Because factors, they're a box. That's my opinion about it. Um, they're just a disaster waiting to happen, right? That's what they are. Uh, so anyway, did I answer your question? Uh, so yeah, if they are a factor... <laughs> no, no, it's like the rhyming is coming back. But uh, they are a factor, make them into uh, an index is the thing to do. And I'll show you how to do that. Okay, where was I? Um, yeah, we highlight it like that. Um, and what you get out of this in the estimation is uh, uh, A bracket 1, A bracket 2, 3, 7 individuals, um, one for each of them. And they're, these are intercepts, and each gets used... Uh, uniquely for uh, different cases in the data to make predictions. And they're the kind of baseline pulling lefted pullingness, right? They're the left handedness in a sense on a log odd scale of each actor um, when both predictor variables are zero, right? In the baseline uh, condition. Does this make some sense? Uh, so notice uh, here's actor two, right? Remember, actor two was the one that always pulled the left lever, always, always, always. And the posterior mean here is 10.6. <laughs> so I told you five means always. Uh, so what does 10 mean? <laughs> that means forever, right? After the earth has been swallowed by the sun, this chimpanzee will still be pulling the left-hand lever, right? <laughs> and, uh, but notice, I mean, uh, look, at the, look at the highest posterior density interval over there. It goes up to 20, uh, really, really high. Um, what's going on here? Oh, notice the NF is smaller, too, because uh, this is a symptom of it. This posterior distribution for this parameter is not Gaussian, and so it gets sampled less efficiently. And so that shows up in the NF as well. Um, what's happening? This is an important thing to realize about GLMs. Uh, there are ceiling and floor effects, and they affect the shape of the posterior distribution. So I'm showing you in the graph on the right-hand part of this slide is the marginal posterior distribution for actor number two's intercept. And... Uh, it's reliably above zero, so we're, we're really confident that actor two likes pulling the left, right, just left-handed. Uh, we're about as confident as possibly could be. But the data do not discriminate among any value of this parameter that is high enough to ensure that they will nearly always pull the left-hand lever. Infinity will make the same predictions as 10. The likelihood function doesn't discriminate among the parameter values. And this is a consequence of the ceiling and floor effects. It's a consequence of the change in geometry between the prediction space and the parameter space. And this is a, a commonplace thing about GLMs um, to keep in mind. And or as I say at the bottom of the slide, if you, if you rely upon the data to do all the driving, it might drive off a cliff. Uh, because the data doesn't discriminate among the options uh, quite often. But you may have information that lets you do so. Uh, for example you know that infinity is not the right value for this parameter, right? They're probably not that left-handed, right? Uh, uh, the other effects could nudge them off it. If you piled enough food on the other side of the table, we could probably get actor number two to start pulling the other lever. It'd be an experiment to try. Um, 
So uh, this is a really common issue, and in non-Bayesian uh, uh, model fitting of logistic regressions, people use regularization to deal with this. If you don't, if you have perfectly flat priors, this model ends up unidentified because you get this infinitely long flat part of the likelihood that just once you get up uh, in this graph past about five. It would just be flat forever because the likelihood of the data conditional on any value of this parameter that's higher than, say, 10 is the same. It'll predict, make exactly the same predictions. And the only thing that makes it decline out here is the prior. Uh, I'm not saying that that means that we know it declines in exactly this way. We don't. Um, but it does let you fit the model, uh, which is a nice thing. Right? It makes the model converge. Um, and very simple uh, logistic regressions can exhibit problems when they have flat priors. Here's my favorite case. This is in the book, too, but I, I wanted to highlight it for you guys because it's really this easy. It happens all the time. Um, uh, and we're going to fit with GLM just so you don't trust the built-in tools either. This is a general feature of all golems is that they have these problems. Simple data set. Uh, I, I just build it up with uh, with the repeat function up there. And this is what the data frame looks like. We've got an outcome Y. Uh, half of the values are 0 and half the values are 1. This is going to be a logistic regression. We're going to predict y. We're going to predict it using x, which is some predictor. And what I want to show you is uh, minus 1 value of x is associated with 0 except in one case, number 10. And a 1 value is associated with 1s except for also in that one case. Right? So there's almost a perfect association between the x's and the y's, but not perfect, almost perfect. Um, when you run this model, that's what you get for estimates. Uh, and I, I think I've trained you guys well enough that you would not use those estimates, right? If you look at the standard deviations on those posterior uh, distributions. What's going on here? Um, the data don't discriminate. It wants to make the slope infinite, basically. It's happy to make the slope infinite, because there's an almost perfect uh, relationship between the two. And the iteratively reweighted least squares method that GLM uses just freaks out in this circumstance. But you know better. You can fix this really easy with a tiny bit of regularization on the regression coefficient. And it solves it right up. And I show you how to do that in the book. I show you to take this model, put it in math with a weekly regularizing prior on the beta coefficient, and then you get sensible estimates um, uh, right away. Uh, so you just have to worry. GLMs are like this, I'm afraid. Um, that's just how they are. But you guys are going to be skilled, and you'll handle it. Right? Uh, you just can't trust the machine anymore. So uh, what do we learn now? Well, handedness, the, the predictions get a whole lot better once we've got these uh, intercepts unique to actor. I'm just showing you uh, four of the interesting ones now to show you the heterogeneity among them. Um, the zigzag is in there for some of the individuals. Like actor number three is definitely responding to food, uh, but not to, like the other individuals, not to uh, the presence of a partner on the other side of the table. Actor five, uh, we get really well done now. But all these intercepts do is move the level of the zigzag, right? They don't change the shape of it across actors. Uh, we need to interact. We need to have different slopes for each of them to do that. And we'll do that when we get to multi-level models. Uh, but uh, uh, we're still, this hasn't changed the predictions about the zigzag shape. There's still no controlling for the heterogeneity and handedness has not revealed some hidden uh, mass uh, 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 impact of the interaction between the other individual being present and um, the, which side had two pieces of food on it. It could have, though, right? It could have been a masking effect. The noise from handedness could have hidden what was going on in the experiment, but it didn't in this case. Make sense? All right. Um, before we leave the chimpanzee example, I want to show you running exactly the same model in a different way. So for any uh, logistic regression, you can take all of the rows that have exactly the same values of predictors and aggregate them into a single row. Just by, just by summing up the outcome uh, across all those rows. And there's a nice function in order to do this. It's called aggregate. <laughs> uh, and so here we're aggregating the outcome variable, pulled left, um, conditional on the values of these predictor variables, prosocial left, condition, and actor. And on any row in which those are all the same, we sum up this outcome variable together and make a single row that has that. And I'll show you what this output looks like in a second. Uh, you can run exactly the uh, same model with the aggregated data, and you'll get the same posterior distribution. And it's often much more convenient because you get a shorter data set. Uh, right? The thing is, it's still a binomial model. Um, so what does the data look like? Here's what the original data looks like, the logistic data, um, just showing you the relevant columns. So uh, on the far right, we have the outcome variable pulled left, zeros or ones. 
Um, and then there are a bunch of different rows. And in some of them, it, the prosocial option is on the left, some of it it's not. And then condition is whether or not uh, the other individual is present. In the first 24 here, we don't see them. And it's actor number one, but we can scroll down past the whole data set. Here it goes. And there we go, 144 rows. Uh, each of them has a zero or one outcome. Uh, but a lot of them have replicated predictor values. So this is not, this is an exploded version, representation of the data. And we can collapse it down with aggregate. And when you do that, um, this is what aggregate makes. It becomes, uh, I'm just showing you for the first two actors, but each actor now gets exactly four rows in the data set because there's only four combinations of treatments, right, of the treatment variables uh, for each actor. So uh, this is actor one's four, this is actor two's four, and then you know actor three gets four, and actor four gets four, and so on. It's a much shorter data set now. And now, just because of the way aggregate works, it calls the new column X. Uh, I haven't figured out how to change that, but you can rename those things later. And uh, now this is the sum pulls of the left-hand lever out of the 18 trials um, that get aggregated together there. How do I know it's 18? Because I know the structure of the data. In different data sets, it'll be different, obviously, right? It'll be something different. So now we want to construct the binomial regression a slightly different way. Um, but we push in now the aggregated version of the data, and now you get an 18 in the likelihood function where there was a 1 before. Because now it's a, it's, what you've observed is a number of successes, a number of left-hand pulls out of 18 trials instead of out of 1. And it's the same kind of thing. It's just a different data representation. Make sense? Yeah. Got a hand? Yeah. So can you put a vector there if you have different number of trials for each individual? Yes. We're going to do that next. Great question. So the question was, can we put a vector there? And yes, you can put data there. And we're going to do that. We're going to put a variable there on the, in the next example. Um, so carry through this to verify for yourself that you get the same posterior distribution. It's the same representation. Yeah. Right. The question was, we're not losing any data, right? We're not losing anything. We're not losing any information at all. It's just aggregated differently, represented differently. It looks different, though. And uh, the aggregated form, well, it depends. In some cases, the aggregated form is better. In, in some cases, it's not. It depends upon, just when we get the multi-level models and we want to deal with over-dispersion. Uh, I'll bring this up back up again, or if I forget, wave your hand vigorously and remind me. Uh, we want to, how you, how you aggregate or not affects your flexibility and where you can model over-dispersion. So we'll worry about that when we get there. Okay, but over dispersion, count data is always over dispersed, pretty much. Uh, yeah, you look like you're going to ask a question. Wait, if ag so if aggregating, um, you assume um, no effective uh, order in terms of how, right. how the data are collected. That's so right. If if you had a data set where you expected that um, the chimpanzees, for instance, might learn that, well, no matter how much food there is over there, I'm not going to get it because you know I'm yeah. pulling the levers. Then if there was a learning element to it, then you might not want to aggregate. That's right. Might be that. um, That's right. The comment was, in case my computer didn't pick it up, uh, what if order mattered and then the individual trials vary conditional on something you might know? Then you get, need to keep it exploded. And then in that case, the predictors wouldn't aggregate together like this. Yeah. There is an order column uh, that goes with this data, and it doesn't have a, an effect that's detectable, uh, which is why I haven't pushed it as part of the analysis. I was kind of, I kind of wish it did. Uh, that would be fun, but it doesn't. No. So, um, all right. Uh, Let's look at another aggregated example before we move on to um, Poisson regression. Uh, this is a famous data set in statistics. Uh, it's used a bunch. Some of you will have seen it before. If not, it's famous, so it deserves to be shown. Uh, so I'm just going to show a standard one. Uh, this is, comes from a paper that was published, I believe it was published in Science uh, in 1974, and it's uh, graduate acceptance and uh, rejection decisions for PhD programs at UC Berkeley, the largest departments in 1973 in UC Berkeley. Uh, anonymized for protection of departments. But you may be able to guess what they are uh, as we go. Um, and uh, one of the, uh, this paper arose because internally UC Berkeley audited this, these admissions things and um, threw up this alarm that it looked like there was severe evidence of gender discrimination in graduate admissions, that women were being admitted less to graduate programs across campus than males were by a large amount. And that's not true, actually, in these data. Uh, but the statistical mistake is worth going through and doing an autopsy on. And the paper that was published explained that, and it's become a standard teaching example of the consequence. Now, this isn't to say that there isn't discrimination in graduate stuff, because I think there is, right? Uh, the, the kind of, you know, drip, drip, drip of uh, all kinds of uh, stuff about uh, places where white guys run everything, right? But uh, in the admissions decisions, the opposite appears, 
is what I want you to see. And that's still true uh, in, these, in these programs. Um, being female helps you get admitted to the program. Once you're in it, then you've got other problems. I know I'm not giving my news flashes to anybody. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but it's just important to say. It's, it's the anthropological uh, uh, injunction to say that just because there's not a problem here doesn't mean there are no problems. <laughs> right. um, okay. So, uh, these data, uh, wait, I showed them on, yeah, I wanted to talk about them on the previous slide. These data are quite simple. Here's the whole data frame. It's an aggregated binomial data set. We've got six departments, two rows for each. On each row, we have male applications and then female applications. Um, the outcome variable is going to be admit. We want to predict the number admitted out of the total number of applications. The total number of applications is just the sum of admit and reject. Yeah, you see that? These are binomial trials. And we're going to assume that every application is independent of all the others, which is a bad assumption, by the way, <laughs> right? Because if anybody has sat on a graduate admissions committee, uh, or know something about it, it's not actually that way because you've got cohort size goals and sometimes you'll admit mediocre candidates uh, just because you need to fill a cohort. People do that. We don't do it in my department, but uh, so there are departments I know that do that. And sometimes there are wonderful people you don't admit because the cohort's full. And that's just a fact. So these aren't independent of one another. But uh, the first level analysis, uh, we'll get the point across anyway. Uh, there's still stuff to figure out about how this works, right? Um, so let's set up the model. Uh, and this is the point where it's just a regular old binomial model. First thing we do up top is I, I take the male variable, which is, in, remember, the gender variable is considered as male and female, and, you know, text doesn't work in stat models, so you got to convert it to numbers. We're going to make a dummy variable called uh, male, uh, one or zero. And um, now there's this column applications, that's data, that becomes the number of trials, and it varies across rows. Uh, monstrously so, actually. The variation in the number of applications across departments is huge. Some departments get a lot of people applying, mainly psychology. Uh, and other departments, like physics, get very few. Uh, there's huge heterogeneity. And as we're going to see, that co-varies with other stuff. Uh, and explains how the mistake arises um, in inference here. Uh, we fit two models. In the top one, um, there's a we put in the male dummy variable to have an effect on the log odds of, of an application being admitted conditional on the gender of the applicant. And in the bottom one, we leave it out. Uh, and then we can do the model comparison and get some assessment of the overfitting risk here. You guys with me so far? The only new thing is, if, to follow up on Katrina's question, can you put a vector in there? There's your vector. <laughs> it works great. Um, do the comparison. Uh, two models. Model 10.6 uh, is doing way better, and that's the one without um, uh, that's the one with uh, the male dummy variable in it, and this is one of those slam dunk cases that we haven't seen much of uh, in this class, but where uh, uh, the, uh, uh, yes, it's more flexible, it's got an extra parameter, and this is one of these cases too where WIC just counts parameters, right, it's just two and one, um, and uh, uh, it's just so much better, the in-sample fit is so much better that it's, it's hard to imagine that uh, uh, this is just overfitting by adding the one thing, and uh, this is the other one out there. So even accounting for the big standard error, right? If you double that, it's still a long way from being equal to the other one. So uh, not much overfitting risk here, right? There's uh, uh, the gender almost certainly does affect the probability that something was admitted in these data, the way we've analyzed it. Uh, so now we look at the estimates to figure out the direction of that effect, and now we come back to relative effects. So to so think about um, uh, logit link models, if you, you exponentiate the a beta coefficient, you get the proportional change in odds. If that's greater than one, that means that you're multiplying the odds of that event uh, by that amount when you increase the predictor by a unit. So in this case, if you change an application's label from female to male, uh, the idea is there's an 84% increase in its probability of admissions in these data. And that's true across all departments. That is true. This is a, the correct description of what's going on. Across all of the applications in the whole data set, uh, male applications were accepted more. That's absolutely true. 84% more likely to be accepted. Um, nevertheless, there's no evidence of gender discrimination. We're coming to that in a second. Uh, you guys with me so far? Yeah? All right. This is a relative effect size, but I don't think it's misleading us here. But it makes it sound big, right? It's like a huge deal. Uh, to get to absolute effects, we're going to crawl that way a little bit, and then, but that's going to vary hugely across departments, so uh, we'll have to deal with that issue. Um, first, let me remind you about how to get to the absolute scale, um, how to interpret these coefficients. You can just uh, 
if you want to compute predictions at the map values, you can just plug them into the logistic function. So to get the prediction for a female application, it's just the logistic of minus 0.83, the probability of admission on average across all departments is about 30%. See that? And then for a male uh, application, you just use the linear model again. It's the intercept plus the beta coefficient times 1 now instead of 0, and that's about 45%. So there's about a 15% difference, which is not tiny. Uh, but that's the absolute scale, is that the math difference on average is about 15%. Does that make sense, how to do this? You want to be able to do both, both the relative and over relative shark, absolute penguin, uh, worth doing. Okay. Um, and uh, so, and also to remind you, to get the full contrast here, uh, you want to get the full posterior distributions. You can just extract samples and put them in directly as well. You could also use link to do this. Uh, but I want to show you, this is the roll-your-own version of doing link, right? And uh, so when you roll your own, you extract the samples yourself, and then you just plug them into the logistic function, and R loves vectors. So when you put vectors in this thing, it gives you a vector of, of uh, answers, a vector of sums first. It adds each of each row of both A and BM together. Then, it, then you get a, a vector of sums of the same length, and then it passes that into logistic. Logistic is also vectorized, so it returns a vector of the logistic transforms of all those sums, and so you get a vector of posterior probabilities of a male being admitted. Uh, and same for the female applications, and then we compute the contrast just by subtracting one from the other. And now we have the distribution of the contrast, and that's the distribution of the posterior distribution of the, of the uh, predicted difference in probability of admission between a male and a female application. You with me? Okay. Uh, and then I'm, I'm just uh, summarizing with quantile here. Um, the median is about 0.14, that's what we got before, and uh, uh, definitely positive, right? We don't get anywhere close to zero here. Lots of evidence that on average across all departments, um, males are getting admitted more. And that's the truth. That is absolutely the truth in this data. So, um, and finally, the, on this issue, here's what this looks like graphically. Uh, the odds ratios, that's the relative risk, that's the posterior distribution of the um, uh, exponent of that coefficient, right, for males, showing you the posterior distribution of the odds ratio. And then on the right is the uh, probability, uh, uh, the posterior distribution of the contrast between the probability a male is admitted and a female is admitted. That's what we just calculated on the previous slide. And these, calculating both these things, right, they both might be important depending upon the situation you're in. This is relative shark on the left, and that's absolute penguin on the right. Make sense? Yeah. At least until you leave the room, it makes sense. I know how this goes. And then it goes out your brain, right? And, uh, okay. Posterior validation check. Here's the part where we see this is not such a great model. We're going to contrast the raw data with the model predictions. Um, raw data shown in blue uh, for each department. And cases in the data set are just plotted across the horizontal, which means the first two are department A, three and four are department B, and so on. Um, uh, the first case for each department there are the male applications, the second are the female applications. I've labeled the first department there to help you out. Remember that. And I've connected uh, data points from the same department with lines. Again, the code to do this is in the book, so if you want to do lines like this, I give you just a loop uh, to do it. Um, and then the posterior predictions are shown with these uh, circles. That's the posterior map prediction of the probability of admission uh, for that case in the data. And the little line segments are the 95% interval of that uh, prediction, and then the little stars are, are accounting for sampling variation from the binomial uh, on top of it. Uh, so that's like what you did using SIM, right? The stars are from SIM, and the, the bars are from link. Um, and uh, I think you can see, so uh, there is heterogeneity in the uncertainty of predictions across cases. Why? Because the sample size varies. In departments with few applications, there's more uncertainty about what to predict. Right, and you see that in some of the, the length of distance between the pluses is bigger for some departments than others as a consequence of that. Because there aren't very many applications on that row. And so you're not sure. There's lots of sampling variation. There's a lot of applications, and you'd be really sure you'd see the average. Right? That's the idea. There are few coin flips for some of these cases because there's very small numbers of applications. But you get the same zigzag. The model thinks that in every department, females on average will be admitted less often. But the truth is... There's only two departments in which female applications were admitted less often. You see? And there are some departments, like the first two, 
where being a female application is a huge move. Uh, and yeah, and those departments are, by the way, engineering and physics. Uh, I happen to know uh, from this data set. So what's going on? Why was the statistical model fooled? Well, we haven't. It's the the actual effect is being masked by the heterogeneity in admissions rates among departments. There's also departments behave differently, conditional on the gender of applications. Uh, physics and engineering want more female applicants, uh, and they also get extraordinarily good ones. Uh, and they nearly always accept them. And um, and it's like this effect. Some of you may know who who played chess competitively that female chess players are extremely good. Uh, because it's not it's not a comfortable social environment to be in if you're a female chess player, so you've got to be like unbelievably excellent to like break through the barrier of discrimination. And so they tend to be the distribution is way non-Gaussian and skewed towards amazing as a consequence of those discrimination effects. And I think this happens in engineering as well as a consequence. They're among the best as a consequence of breaking through it. Um, so anyway, the, there's not great evidence of that in these data, but it's a phenomenon that shows up. Uh, in, in the performance evaluations. So what's actually going on? Let's do it where we put in uh, the intercepts. Overall admission rates vary uh, across departments. We can put in unique intercepts just like we did with the chimpanzees. Now we uh, have a vector of intercepts, one for each department. So there are two rows in the data set. They're going to get the same uh, parameter. Uh, set up the model the same way. Uh, so the top line up there, I'm showing you we make a department ID variable, and I use this function coerce index. Department is a factor, a nasty factor. And, uh, uh, and I'm showing you in the two columns for the data set that are relevant. It takes that factor of letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, and converts it to the nice integers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And those can go into map or map to scan and work great. So here we're doing uh, map fit. Map will treat this, this uh, bracket notation the same way map to scan does. It says... Oh, you want a vector of parameters with that name. I can do that. Uh, let me see all the unique values in, in your index variable. And what happens? Well, um, let's do the full model comparison now. I fit two new models, one with uh, the gender variable, one without. Uh, the top-ranked model now is 10.8. That's the one without the gender variable, uh, but with the individual department dummy variable the individual intercepts for each department. But you'll notice that the, the Akaike weight is split basically equally between the two. So I would interpret this as gender probably matters, but it was overfit in the model uh, that has gender in it, right? So the, the best estimate is probably somewhere between what we see in that model and zero, right? Account for the overfitting. And But let's look at the predictions of model 10.9. Um, which has uh, uh, both the intercepts for each department and um, the coefficient for being male. And now notice that the posterior, the marginal posterior distribution for BM is negative, uh, and reliably so, uh, as a consequence of what your eyes already told you about the data, right? Which is, and it's mainly an effect, most departments don't care. Most departments have pretty much flat lines. We'll look at the data again in a moment. But there are a few departments, and it's those departments that get very few female applicants. They nearly always accept applications that are from them, or at least more than half of them. They, they accept more than half of them. So there's this big effect of it. Um, let's look at the data again. Uh, so uh, the top are the posterior predictions now with the dummy variables for a department. And you'll see now it gets the right inference um, in the predictions. There's this... Very weak uptick. Uh, the expects slightly admissions to be slightly higher for females. It's not tracking the, uh, the first couple cases very well. Why? You guys can probably tell me because the model assumes that the effect of an application being male is the same in every department, right? And that's not true. Uh, almost certainly not true. Departments behave differently because they have different gender ratios in their programs, and they're trying to fix that. Uh, and admissions decisions are heavily weighted by those things. Um, I, I am a member of certain grad programs that I will not name in which uh, uh, there are a whole lot of female applications and it's very rare to get a male application and the bias goes in the other direction. And the university is pushing that, actually. They want it, we've reached that point in certain fields like communications, uh, which I'm not a member of, but communications is the worst case. Uh, it's 99% it's female. Uh, and. Uh, so these departments in this data on the in this data set on the left are like that. They've got uh, gender ratio skews toward males, and they're uh, favoring female applicants. Um, the other departments basically don't care. Uh, but here's the thing: 
Uh, the vast majority of women applying to grad programs at UC Berkeley in 1973 were applying to the departments on the right. And it's very hard to get into those departments. Notice the overall admissions rates are really low. In fact, for Department F, they're nearly zero, right? And that is social psychology, uh, is Department F. Uh, David, give us some uplifting news. <laughs> I only know. Um, is this, does the model do something where it's sort of, regardless of the number of applic total applicants per department, it weights each department equally, or is it sort of, does it understand that Department D, for instance, has 100 total applicants, Department A has 500 applicants, and so as we generate the BM, we fill up the uh, paints, sample size, and the department. Uh, if I understand your question, the answer is yes. Um, the binomial model is taking the sample size in each row into account. That automatically gets all of that is, is getting into it. And that's because we didn't convert things to proportions. Right? So we're, we know the number of trials. And in departments where there are fewer trials, there's less information. And, and the posterior distribution reflects that automatically, just because Bayes' theorem. <laughs> I don't know. That is, that's what I need a bumper sticker. Just because. Just because Bayes' theorem. Because Bayes. Theorem. Because Bayes. Yes. So in figuring out the effect of uh, gender, is it weighting each applicant the same, or is it weighting like, exactly the same? Yeah, every applicant every applicant is getting the same effect, yeah, in this model. Uh, when we do multi-level models and there's heterogeneity to be inferred, it won't be that, be that way. We'll talk about it again when we come back to this issue. We could do better than this, actually. Uh, in balance. And I think there's clearly heterogeneity, and we're going to reanalyze this model in a couple weeks with varying slopes so we can deal with the fact that departments respond differently to the gender of applicants. And we can do that as well. Uh, everything can vary, not just intercepts, but you can make every parameter in your model vary by department. And it's probably a good idea here, and so we'll do that in a couple weeks. Um, and uh, cool stuff will happen. Something I call multi dimensional shrinkage. Which <laughs> I know, you weren't expecting that. That was it's not as catchy as uh, relative charm. But uh, okay, so just to remind you to see what's going on here, why did we get tricked? The, the autopsy on this is why did we get tricked the first time? We got tricked the first time because there was a correlation between an applicant being an application being uh, from a woman and the admissions rate, the overall admissions rate of the department. Women tend to apply. So look at uh, uh, number of applications uh, here uh, uh, from, from women. Uh, very few up here is only 8 to Department B, only 19 to Department A. Uh, hundreds to the departments down here. The departments down here have really low admissions rates. Social psychology was taking around 5% of men and women. No evidence of gender bias. It's just women prefer to apply to the departments that were hard to get into. So if you ignore the department heterogeneity, you reach the wrong answer. Make sense? Uh, so this is called Simpson's paradox in statistics, which you don't really need to like burrow into that. Just remember that you got to think about ways you could be tricked. You can't trust your models, uh, and if there's a lot of heterogeneity across different clusters in the model, it's very easy to be fooled this way. Very, very easy to be fooled. You can be fooled in the opposite direction too. Uh, so uh, you have you have to be careful. Okay. Um, let me summarize binomial GLMs, and then we'll do. We have enough time to do uh, uh, Poisson models uh, before you go. Um, we use these to predict counts that have some fixed known maximum. That maximum can vary across cases, like it did in the example we just did. But the idea is, it's binomial when you know the trials. Right? Uh, use a logit link. It's conventional and it's the best choice. There are other choices, uh, and if you have a good reason to use a different choice, you, you'll know. You'll be in a situation where you've read enough about it and you know you want to do it. Um, uh, d distrust map estimation. Often it works unreasonably well, as I showed you an example. But if you get a posterior distribution pushed up against the ceiling or floor, high log odds like 5 or, minus, or low ones like minus 5, then you probably want to go to Markov chains uh, or some other method that doesn't make assumptions about the shape of the posterior distribution, so you're not fooled. Um, regularization is really important for getting these models to converge because uh, really strong effects will have flat regions in the likelihood, but data just don't discriminate among different values of the parameter. You can't let the data do all the driving. You just can't. I know it sounds like a horrible anti-scientific thing to say, but conditional on models, data don't discriminate among things that you may already know some of those things are stupid, right? And the data in the model doesn't know that. 
Uh, so you could do better. Uh, it's like you're the backseat driver. Let the data drive, but you've got to intervene. If the data's been drinking, then <laughs> you've got to grab the wheel, right? And that's how it goes. Um, that's a horrible metaphor. <laughs> wow. Uh, so now Katrina's like shaking her. <laughs> uh, you, you know me, Katrina, though. This is that's not the worst thing I've ever said. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, yeah, usual my mantra applies. We, it's really important to focus on predictions and not parameters now. Really important, uh, and especially because there are these ceiling and floor effects uh, that are going to happen. Okay, um, so now let's let's come back to our exponential family. We want to talk about Poisson models now. That'll be the last model type for this week. And to ease you into that, Poisson distributions are just a special case of the binomial. I said this before, they have the same maximum entropy constraints, um, but we get to use them when we don't know the number of trials because the Poisson is a special shape uh, where the variance and the expected value are the same. Uh, and you get that from a binomial when there are very, very, very large number of trials and the probability of a success in each is really, really low. Uh, and then you get this special shape. So let's start, let me demonstrate to you that to you just through a simulation example. We're looking at, remember our flies uh, dying in test tubes or our graduate students passing prelims, right, in the first uh, year up here. And um, here's a binomial distribution, uh, uh, numbers out of 10 that pass their prelims. The mean is about 4, the variance 2.4. Uh, as, uh, as we decrease the rate of success, it moves the mean uh, to the left. Um, and as, if we also then uh, increase vastly the number of graduate students and, and in proportion decrease their probability of passing prelims, so it's like there's a vast army of grad students we're admitting to teach our intro freshman comp courses. This is how English departments work. Uh, and uh, I know it's cruel, but it's, it's true. And uh, most of them are never going to make it to the PhD program because there's a bottleneck that's imposed there. Then you get a distribution that is technically binomial, but the mean and the variance approach one another and eventually converge to the same value. Uh, so showing you here a probability of passing your prelims of, of about 1% out of 200 graduate students, the mean's 2.8, the variance is about 2.8. Uh, if it's, uh, again, 1% and they're 500, now they're even closer, right? 7.07, 7.02. Um, and, and out of 900 students, uh, uh, again, almost exactly, within simulation variance. And these distributions are examples of Poisson distributions. And there's nothing magical about them. Again, they're just binomial distributions. But you never, the observed values never get anywhere close to the maximum, the theoretical maximum. Because most events are failures. Right? Not sad now. <laughs> and I'm going to bum out Jason over there. <laughs> but you're going to pass, don't worry. <laughs> um, so... Uh, uh, lots of examples, really, really, so if you had, like, if you have a number of trials, 6,000, you need a very low probability of success, but still, uh, the variance equals the mean, and this lets us, uh, this is something called the Poisson distribution, has a very nice um, mathematical function that requires only one parameter to describe its shape, because now the mean and the variance are the same, and this parameter is usually called lambda, and it's equal to the exponential rate uh, that was present in the uh, previous graphs. Uh, but you can think of it as the mean number, or as the inverse of, of the exponential rate and the other. And you can think of it as the average number of successes per unit time. Um, so we use these when we have counts where there's no clear upper limit. We don't know it. Uh, so what could this be? It's like mortality data. You're counting deaths. Uh, one famous example, I think I have this on the next slide, is number of soldiers killed in the Prussian army by donkey kicks. Uh, famous is one of the earliest data analytic applications of a plus on regression and very important problem right <laughs> livestock kick people <laughs> and it's a big deal um, and in that case we don't know how many soldiers were exposed to potential death from donkey kick right we don't have the exposure variable so but we can still do good statistics with this by estimating the rate at which it happens in different contexts um, so uh, this is named after uh, Semillon Denis Poisson uh, who did a bunch of cool stuff in mathematics. I love the cover of this book, by the way. I'm going to get a photo of myself to hang up sitting like that. <laughs> but, uh, I haven't found those pants yet, so <laughs> um, So that aside. Uh, so great great uh, kind of classic applications of Poisson regression. Soccer goals per game. Any, I'm sure there are soccer fans here. Soccer is a great game, but man, it's not high scoring. 
right? I mean, most of the time it's just really hunky guys running and sweating a lot, right? And uh, so it's fun to watch, but but there's not a lot of balls going into nets. <laughs> and uh, so Poisson distributions work great uh, for that. Uh, uh, fissions per unit time in uranium, uh, almost exactly Poisson distributed, independent fission events, uh, really large amount of matter that could decay, but the probability of any atom decaying at any unit time is really small. Uh, Photon striking the detector, same kind of story. And then here are the famous soldiers in the Prussian army killed by horse kicks. It was horses, I guess, um, uh, per year. And DNA mutations, closer to home for many of you, DNA mutations per strand per generation are approximately plus on as well uh, for all these reasons. Very large number of sites that could mutate. Uh, most of them don't because mutation rates are low. Does this make some sense? Uh, so this gives you just some heuristic about when to know you're in one of these situations. So let's do a data analytic example. I have just enough time, I think, to do this. Um, uh, this is uh, a paper that was published by uh, Michelle Klein down there. Some of you know her, I think. Uh, and uh, Michelle's a postdoc at ASU, and she works in Fiji and studies the, the cultural evolution of oceanic societies. Um, and uh, this is a paper she's done with kind of a historical analysis, interested in long-term technological evolution and the complexity of toolkits in island societies and the size of populations. The background theory very quickly is that large human populations can retain and develop more technology. Um, you lose, so it turns out there's some evidence of drift losing technology. If the only person who knows how to make a bow and arrow dies before they teach someone else, you lose bow and arrow. Happens. <laughs> uh, it happens in graduate programs all the time, not with bows and arrows, but with like statistics. Right, <laughs> and the last quantitative anthropologist leaves your department. And, uh, yeah, so we won't talk about that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I guess we will at some point. But <laughs> we won't talk about that. So, uh, so there's a drift effect, but there's also the adult catalytic effect that all attempts to learn technology have some error variance in it, and it's only rare individuals that innovate something that makes it better. So the more people who are trying. Uh, the more positive mutations you can have. So this is exactly like in genetical evolution, it's often mutation limited. Big populations evolve more efficiently because there's more opportunity to get positive mutations. Same thing can happen in human cultural evolution. And so Michelle uh, is trying to see if she can find a whiff of evidence of this in an oceanic tool data set. And unfortunately, this is all we have to work with. <laughs> uh, this is the whole data set right here. But hey, you know, you, you go to war with the data you have, not the data you wish you had. Uh, the caveat here is, you might think the sample size is, what, there are 10 islands here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. The sample size is not 10, though, because there are a lot of count events that go on in these tools. So it's not, the traditional ideas of what sample size are in count models, it's not transparent. Uh, it's not like in a simple regression model, where you can break apart uh, these things. And this will make a little bit more sense if I, if I get, when I get to exposures um, in Poisson models. So we're interested in the association between the complexity of the toolkit, we're going to be focusing on the total tools column. That's the total number of distinct technological types of tools. There are classes of tools. And uh, some of these are kinds of kayaks, things like that, all kinds of fancy uh, farm implements and so on. Bows and arrows, knives, fish hooks, uh, cool things like that. And um, uh, we're interested in the association between the total tools and the logarithm of population, uh, the magnitude of the population size. So the as the population size grows in magnitude, that is, we use its logarithm as a measure of its magnitude, um, we expect a relationship between total tools and uh, the log population. Um, and then there may be this monitoring effect of contact. Some of these island societies historically had, had really well articulated trade networks with other islands, and so they might get more technology just because of that. And we're going to return to this um, in the last week and do uh, a spatial autocorrelation model with this where we actually look at island dyads and transporter tools. Uh, but we'll, we'll punt on that for the moment. So, yeah. So I guess Hawaii is not the state, it's just the island. It's the, it's, this is historical Hawaiian culture that we're talking about. Not contemporary Hawaii, but well, Keanu and all that. Multiple islands. That's what I'm yeah, yeah, it's the whole, the whole the set whole of kingdoms and everything. Yeah. Okay. yeah, yeah. The whole kingdom, yes. And, uh, all right, so um, here's the anatomy of a Poisson GLM. Uh, let me step through. The, I think you can probably make sense of this already because you guys are getting uh, pro at this, right? I mean, it doesn't matter what the likelihood is called. I can call it foo, and you would know it's a likelihood. It's got some parameter in it, right? 
and we can call that TARDIS, and you can put a link function on TARDIS, and you attach that to a linear model, and you go to town, right? Uh, but uh, these are the conventions. So the outcome variable here is total tools. We notate that the same way. Um, the only parameter that we need to establish a link to is the expected number of tools for k psi. We use a log link because we want it to, that has to be positive. So we use the log link to constrain the expected count to be positive, right? zero or greater. Uh, so the log link will do that. Uh, this, this means we're assuming an exponential relationship between the value of the linear model and, and lambda. Remember, right? lambda equals the exponentiation of that whole linear model. And inside the linear model, this, there's nothing new here. Um, we have log population, a coefficient for it, a, co a dummy variable for contact rate. Mary was a, an island that had high contact with its neighbors or not. Uh, and then an interaction term to deal with any monitoring influence. For example, you might think that having a small population isn't as bad if you have high contact. And that's an interaction hypothesis. Right? You guys with me? Um, I love this data set, by the way. It's, like, it's tiny, so it's easy to think with. Obviously, we want more data, but it's nice to have small data sets for teaching, right? As you can kind of see it all on the same screen. Okay, and then, of course, we've got to have priors, and these are uh, ye olde regularizing priors. Alphas has, is flat because we have no idea where intercepts end up, right? Let the intercept land where it may. Let the slopes guide it. Uh, then we regularize the slopes so that the model is tamed. There's very little data here, so actually my preference would be to use even stronger uh, regularizing priors than these. Uh, these aren't all that strong. Uh, these correspond to, I think I've told some of you before, if you have a, a Gaussian prior centered on zero with a standard deviation of one, that's the posterior distribution you would get if you had observed one Gaussian deviated zero in a previous analysis that started with a flat prior. Uh, so it's very weak. It's one, it's, it's the amount of evidence equivalent to one observation at zero. Uh, nevertheless, it helps you fit models, right? Um, I would prefer something smaller, like 0.1 in this case, because there's not a lot of data, and we, there's overfitting risk here, right? Of course, you're not going to get more islands. Uh, <laughs> that's at least you might have to wait a long time to get more oceanic islands. But um, okay, uh, set up uh, the variables we need. Construct ahead of time log pop. This is always a good idea. You can get away with it in some cases, but um, it's, it's always a good idea to construct your transforms before you plug them into the model. And then construct a dummy variable for contact and make it contact high. Uh, all, all implied jokes uh, are intended. <laughs> and, uh, then we uh, fit the map model. Um, no surprises here. Log of lambda is the linear model. You can break linear models uh, across lines. In fact, it's often a good idea. Just always put the plus at the end. Not at the start. As some of you who are strong in R foo know a plus at the start of an R line means continue input from the previous line, and it eats the plus. This is maddening. Absolutely maddening, and I curse the New Zealand programmers who guys designed it this way. But uh, it's just how it is. So always put the plus at the end of the line, not at the start of the line. Um, and uh, and you've seen this vector notation for priors before. I'm saying all three of those parameters get that prior. That's what that means. Okay, fitting works great here, uh, no problems. And um, showing you the marginal posterior distributions for these. Um, here's another case where you have to be aware of marginal estimates. It looks like if you just look at um, the marginal posteriors for BC, which is the effect of contact, the main effect of contact, and then the interaction of contact with population, it looks like neither matters much. They're really close to zero, and they straddle both sides a huge amount. That is not true. Contact matters here, and the interaction might matter, uh, because these two things are highly correlated. I'm going to show you that on the next slide. It's clear population uh, matters, right? It's positive and has a tight confidence interval. Log population is strongly associated with the complexity of toolkits across oceanic societies. Um, let me show you what goes on. So notice I, I put up the correlations here to show you that these two, BC and BPC, are almost perfectly negatively correlated with one another. Uh, and that's why you get tricked by the marginal posterior distribution. This happens all the time, remember? So I'm trying to program you to distrust coefficients. Um, and if you look at the pairs plot, you can really see this, right? See that, that beautiful little wedge uh, diagonal for the two parameters. Um, if, one is, if one is small, the other is big. If one is big, the other is small. When you combine them and multiply them by the right predictor values, they affect prediction a lot, it turns out. So you want to construct predictions to see that. So um, how do you do that? Again, here, you could use link to do this, but I'm showing you how to, how to do it yourself. Extract the samples, just plug the linear model in, but now it's not logistic because the inverse link is exponent. EXP, because that undoes a log, right? Logistic undoes a logic transform. 
exp undoes a log transform. It's the reverse operation. The inverse link here is exp. So you put uh, the linear model into the exponent function, uh, you get the expected number out for lambda high means islands with high contact rate, lambda low means islands with low contact rate. Um, and then we can construct the contrast, uh, the, the posterior dif distribution of the difference in the expected total tools between islands with high and low. And I plugged in, notice I plugged in an 8 up there, that's log population, uh, just as an example. Uh, you have to do it across those, and we'll do that in a slide in a moment. Um, and I'll show you here is that 95% of the posterior probability for this contrast is above zero. So the model is actually saying on the prediction scale, uh, islands with high contact have more tools. But you couldn't see that in the marginal posterior because the marginal posterior is a lying cheat. Right? It doesn't show you the covariation. It just doesn't. Uh, this is, again, think of William Thompson's tide machine. These models are like tide machines. You can't just look at the gears at the bottom and figure out what the, it says about ties on the top. Uh, you got to look at the top. You tune the gears, but you look up uh, at the tide reader. Um, so if you look at this distribution, this is what it looks like. Uh, on the bottom left, posterior distribution of the difference in expected numbers of tools between high contact islands and low. It's not all above zero, but this is good evidence that contact rate is associated with more complex toolkits, controlling for population size. Um, and then it's a consequence. Here showing you this is the posterior distribution, the joint posterior distribution of the two parameters. I'm showing you with these bars on the axes, the margins. You get tricked by the margins because see where zero is? The average is near zero. Uh, and it, it's wide on both sides. The same for the other one. It's near zero wide on both sides. But when one, when this one's big, the other one's really small. When this one's really big, the other one's really small. Uh, so you get tricked between the two. Right? They contain similar information. And that's why you get this in it. Um, okay. Now, now I'm making you wonder about every paper you've ever read, hopefully, right? <laughs> because many of them contain only tables of coefficients. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you can go really wrong with this stuff. Um, yeah, we should pay a large group of, of statisticians to audit the, the journal Science and Nature uh, over stuff like this, actually. I think it'd be fun. Um, I had to only do it after tenure, though. But uh, anyway, uh, I got only a couple minutes. I'll finish this example, and uh, we'll talk about uh, uh, that'll be plenty for you to do your homework. Um, so we do the model comparison. Uh, uh, all I want to say about this is uh, the model comparison WAIC is constructed on the prediction scale, so it automatically takes account of the correlations in the posterior distribution, so it doesn't get fooled uh, like the coefficient table can trick you. Right? And what the, what the model comparison says is that log population really matters a lot. Contact uh, might matter. The interaction, mm, some evidence that there's an interaction, a moderating effect of contact on the effect of log population, but uh, both of them matter. So you can see the highly ranked models uh, contain both log pop and contact, but the top rank model doesn't contain the interaction. See that? But you get a lot of model weight for both. Um, this is what the predictions look like. Um, so the horizontal here is is log population, so that's the magnitude of the population, and uh, total tools is on the natural scale is plotted on the vertical. And I'm showing you the the points or the actual raw data, the different societies. This is Hawaii up here in the upper right really big, uh, have, have really complicated tool sets. I mean, really extraordinary tool sets, actually, in contact. And um, uh, open circles mean low contact. So Hawaii had low contact. Why? Because it was out in the middle of bump up Pacific. Part of the technical term in anthropology there. But no, it's just like, it was discovered really late as a consequence, because it's not in the trade winds. It's, really hard to discover. It took forever. The other oceanic islands were discovered really rapidly because they just get blown into them uh, in that part of the Pacific. Uh, so, and then the filled circles are the high contact islands. And then I'm showing you the two prediction envelopes um, for the expected number of tools and the 95% interval of that expectation. The blue and the blue region around it is the high contact islands at given log population sizes and then low contact as well. So log population has a huge effect across the data. Uh, and then you can take Hawaii out, by the way, and it barely changes the estimates. Uh, almost no effect. Hawaii looks like an outlier, but actually it's dead in the middle of the prediction, so it's not it's not exerting much leverage. Um, contact, less evidence, but there's evidence consistent with contact mattering, but eh, it's hard to say how important it is. Um, okay, uh, with that, uh, I've got extra stuff that I'm not going to get to, so let me uh, very quickly get to your homework slide. Hang on. 
And also, I want to show uh, somebody an illuminated manuscript. Yeah, there. I said I would put one in here. There you go, just for you. Um, and here, all right, your homework. Uh, what I went over there was exposure, how to do exposures. There's a section at the end of the chapter I encourage you to read on that. Um, sometimes the amount, the observation window for a Poisson variable differs across cases, and you'll want to cope with that. It's easy. It's called an exposure or an offset. I have a computed example at the end of the chapter. You should take a look at it. You don't need it for your homework, though. For your homework, you're going to analyze pirate eagles. Bald eagles are bastards, so I was explaining to my office mates earlier. Uh, big bald eagles nearly always steal food from smaller eagles. Seriously, bald eagles, symbol of America. <laughs> so that whatever you want. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so you're going to analyze a behavioral ecological data set on eagle piracy from other eagles. And that will, that will help you practice your binomial regression skills. And then there's a cool salamander density uh, data set from Northern California. Uh, the so called Del Norte salamander. Uh, and uh, you'll practice Poisson regression uh, with that. Have fun with it, and I'll see you guys next week. Thank you.